Siguiendo, ya vi. Guten Tag, meine Damen und Herren, willkommen. Und uh, wir gehen jetzt auf Englisch reden, leider. Mal gut. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to workshop 282, entitled Data Governance by Artificial Intelligence, Putting Human Rights at Risk. We have here an extraordinarily high-level panel uh, who I'm very, very thrilled to be able to introduce to you shortly. We also have people, we believe, um, here by remote participation. So please bear with us while we just sort out who is here online and who is not. Uh, my name is Marianne Franklin, and I'm representing the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition. And we're very, very happy today to have co-organized this panel with Amnesty International Germany and to be able to address to the floor, to the IGF, and for the record, the pressing questions around governance, artificial intelligence, and human rights. So, the guiding question for today goes like this. What are the regulatory, technical, and ethical considerations for what we could call human rights, artificial intelligence by design? So before I introduce the panelists, I need to explain a little bit this format. It's uh, based on a very popular television show in the United Kingdom, still a member of the EU, last time I heard. <laughs> it's called Question Time, and it's modeled on Prime Minister's Question Time, where elected representatives in the House of Representatives, which is called Westminster for short in the UK, uh, asked questions. So this is the same today. But this is a TV program, so we have our questions ready and scripted. We have people who are going to ask those questions. They've sent us their questions in. These questions will be short, and there will be time for you in the audience also to put your questions, hopefully, if there is enough time, to our panel. Uh, we also, I will ask our panel to do some opening statements as well. But basically, it's question time. So the panelists do not know the questions that they will get. Um, but I'm sure they will all cope. They are not under any obligation to answer every question put to them. So just so you know. <laughs> and uh, that's the format. I cannot possibly try to be Fiona Bruce, for those of you who know who now currently presents Question Time, but I will do my best. So I'd like now to introduce our panelists. Um, to my right, 
I have Renata Avilia, who's Executive Director of Smart Citizens Foundation. Thrilled to have you here, Avilia, um, Renata, who has to leave at 5.30. So just so you know, Renata will be leaving half an hour before we finish. So thank you so much, Renata. Uh, and to her left is Marcus Bako, the Secretary General of Amnesty International Germany. Willkommen, Marcus. Hello. And to my right, we have a new member of our panel, which is Asai Fipra from IT for Change India. And I'm Marianne, as I just said. And I believe Google, Alex Warden from Google, is on her way. Hopefully, she will arrive. Is there any Google representative in the audience? OK. Tech sector were invited. So let's hope that our Google representative can get here. And to my left immediately is Paul Nemitz, Principal Advisor for DG Justice at the European Commission and a member of the German Data Ethics Commission as well. Thank you so much, Paul, for being with us. So let's get started. The first part, of course, we will ask our panelists uh, to do two things, just to get us settled and thinking in the right space. They have been asked the very simple job of defining, in so many words, what they mean by artificial intelligence. Then they're going to have an even simpler task to list one and no more than three most pressing issues at stake that they consider are at stake at the intersection of artificial intelligence research and development and its on online deployment, particularly in light of human rights law and norms. So we'll let them have the floor first. And if you're running out of definitions, I have two official ones here to add to the record in case we need any more. But let's start, first of all, to my left, Mr. Nemitz. Thank you very much. Thank so, you very sorry, sorry. First of all, the definitions, and then we'll go the pressing issues, just so you know. Yes, thank you very much, and uh, it's a great format. So on the definition, there are, of course, hundreds uh, of definitions um, in the EU. Uh, we have no uh, legally binding uh, definition, but we have a definition of the high-level group on AI, which was an independent advisory group of the European Commission, which basically said AI are systems which adapt to their environment in in an effort to fulfill uh, certain predefined goals and act in adaptation to the feedback they get uh, from the environment. It's a complicated uh, definition, but I think it serves the purpose. It's, it's wide enough. Okay, the, so, three, oh, the three uh, issues... Uh, no, we'll go to definitions first. If that's right. Okay, Paul, so that the definitions are all clustered together. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Shai. Is this working? Yeah. Uh, I'm from a civil society organization called IT for Change. And at IT for Change, we prefer to use the term digital intelligence over the term artificial intelligence. Because uh, the meaning of what is artificial and what is intelligent changes over time as human uh, expectations of technology change. And so we think the term digital intelligence underscores what is important about uh, the technology that we are seeing these days, which is the digital infrastructure and the use of data. Thanks so much. And onwards, Marcus. Thank you. It's great to be on. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. It's great to be on question time, as I have many questions, and I'm looking forward to discuss them with them. But yes, artificial intelligence. Um, rather than uh, trying to add another definition, I'd like to share with you what we at Amnesty International currently focus on, and it's um, artificial in a rather narrow sense and focusing particularly on machine learning and automated algorithm-based decision-making um, and their ap applications in rather concrete and defined areas. Um, and we look at this uh, especially in differentiation with around the degree of human interaction, for instance, in, in the decision-making, I mean, div differentiating between algorithm-based decisions, which are still human decisions, but, uh, but supported, uh, or algorithm-driven decisions, which are largely shaped by outputs of algorithmic systems and uh, algorithm-determined <coughs> sorry decisions, uh, uh, which trigger consequences. And then secondly, the potential human rights impact um, that uh, artificial intelligence has. Thanks so much, Marcus. And moving on, Renata. 
Yeah, I didn't, I didn't find a good definition that will make me fully happy. Uh, and I shared the vision of ID for Change, and I, I think that that's a, a good way to frame it. But I will like to refer, I don't know if I should jump immediately to the three pressing issues that I think that, uh, that I'm, as a human rights lawyer, makes me very, very, very worried. The first is augmented inequalities. Uh, the ability of the deployment uh, and decisions at this level to uh, make uh, to harm horizontally a large number of vulnerable people, and and, and not only the um, crystallization of inequalities that we have in the world today, but uh, making them more uh, severe and more invisible and harder to hold accountable. The second is the democratic, democratic deficit in decision making and accountability. We spent the last decade trying to open governments. We, start, we started with the access to information laws and we started to try uh, with the open data movement, trying to open and see the machine from the states uh, from the inside. It, it has been harder with companies because of the trade secret laws and so on. But now we are at the moment that the decision, not even the decision makers will be able to um, explain properly and be held accountable uh, uh, because they will blame the, the machine. And if they cannot understand the machine and the machine that you cannot open, uh, then we will have a big democratic deficit as citizens because we cannot even point out, we will not be able to point out at what's wrong in the system, just at the effects. And the third is automated manipulation. So one of the principles of, uh, on Article 19 is to access information without interference. And we have seen that many of the experimentation do done in the artificial intelligence field is on uh, news distribution and curation. So you have a machine curating your news and your access to information and selecting what is best for you. And I think that that will profoundly modify Article 19 and it will deeply affect uh, um, our freedom, basically. If you can manipulate at a lar larger scale, um, it, it is a, it's a big problem for democracy and for human rights. Thank you very much, Renata. So going backwards in direction, Marcus, the three pressing, you can have only one if you like, but you have no more than three pressing issues to state today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I'd, rather than looking at pressing issues, uh, please allow me to look at um, three actors, I believe, um, mostly relevant. And, um, and let me start with regulation and the state and um, the international community. And um, as, as Amnesty International is extremely concerned about uh, the widespread adoption of machine learning and automated decision-making systems without an adequate consideration for their impact as a critical threat to human rights. And we believe uh, that there is the need to ensure that artificial intelligence is not only human-centered. And when I say human-centered, I'm not looking at, for instance, um, those using and applying artificial intelligence and also not using uh, and also not looking at individuals as users, but um, really focusing on individuals as individual rights holders and the effects on their fundamental rights. So Amnesty International believes that uh, we need to apply existing human rights protections to the development and the use of these new machine learning technologies. And so uh, this should happen on the basis of new international law to prohibit the development and use of certain artificial intelligence technologies, such as autonomous weapon systems, and also define um, the use of, of, of artificial intelligence. And um, just going back to what uh, the, the uh, German Data Ethics Commission, uh, on which uh, Paul also said, uh, looked at, I, we think that uh, one important criteria for this is to have a proper assessment of the, of the infringements and the interventions artificial intelligence potentially has to basic fundamental rights and develop a, a system and as probably related to as, as they have uh, within their report um, to rank, uh, to rank um, the, the impact artificial intelligence system may have, and accordingly to that also define different levels of regulation and oversight. 
Thanks very much, Marcus. Shai. Um, I think when we're talking about artificial intelligence and human rights, one of the main issues that comes up is the question of development. Specifically, how do countries or sets of people within countries pursue development, which is central to the human right to live a life with dignity? How do you uh, foreground dignity in a situation where we've seen that artificial intelligence has had, till now, a monopolizing tendency? How do you provide choice to uh, people within countries? How do you tackle the issue that most development of artificial intelligence technology till now has happened uh, in private companies? And we cannot control the uses to which it is put. Uh, the climate implications of using artificial intelligence algorithms and training data sets, uh, which, for which there is uh, new evidence to show that it has extremely adverse effects on energy use. Uh, the second most important issue is that of uh, data, specifically who is able to control the uses to which data is put through artificial intelligence. Uh, because we might want to think about cases where AI should not be used, uh, specifically where human rights will be affected very badly, and you can only wield that control through wielding control over data that AI uses. And we might also want to use AI to, uh, we might want to put it to good use to solve some human problems, to ensure human rights. And to be able to do that in a democratic way, you would want democratic control over the data that pe the people themselves generate. And so uh, these, I think, are the two main issues about artificial intelligence. Thanks so much. Uh, Paul, for you. Yes, <clears throat> so the question was, what are the main research challenges? I would say uh, the first research challenge is, how can we uh, build democracy, rule of law, fundamental rights, sustainability into systems of AI? And this thought is, of course, inspired by the legal obligation in Europe to build privacy into systems of data protection by default and by design, and I think we have to extend this principle, which so far is only in the GDPR, for data protection and privacy to the broader principles of free societies. And, uh, you know, it's great to state those principles. The question is how to then operationalize this in technology. I think that's the first important research task. Second, which of the challenges identified in the around 70 ethics codes, including the AI high-level group ethics code for the European Union on trusted AI, which of those challenges require a law, a law which has democratic legitimacy and can be enforced also against those who don't want to play ball? And which challenges, on the other hand, us of such nature that with good conscience we can leave them to ethics codes and self-regulation. I think that is really, we are now at this critical juncture. The President of the European Commission uh, uh, from today onward, Mrs. von der Leyen, has said very clearly we will do a law on uh, AI, on trusted AI, AI which um, works in line with our values. But the question is what to put into it from the challenges um, identified in previous ethics discussions, and I think that will be both a political issue, it's, uh, but it's also still an issue of drawing the line, what's so essential that it has to be in the law. And the third question is, how are we going to assess impacts in the future of AI systems? How are we going to develop control technologies for these very complex systems? I think we cannot accept that there are systems which are not able to explain themselves, and that's not only that we can't accept them because of the rule of law, the, you know, the government always must give reasons, there can be no programs which don't explain themselves in government service, that's for sure, but also, let's say, for security, for cyber safety, for cyber security, you will never use programs which you don't understand. So, it's about understanding uh, the programs from, on the one hand, analyzing the code, of course, not just by humans looking at the code, but by having control programs for AI. We need to develop control technology, which on the one hand looks at the programs, but on the other hand, and this is a new uh, school of research here in Berlin at the Max Planck Institute, 
with a professor which was just is just coming from the MIT in uh, Boston, Iyad Ravan, who um, has is developing a new methodology to look at these programs on the basis of the code, sort of look into it, but also look at them from the outside, you know, like a psychoanalyst looks at the human behavior from the outside and asks questions and, you know, how do you feel and looks at the behavior. I think we need the same type of new methodology and research to re-engineer and understand how do uh, programs which have this or that code, how do they actually develop, how do they learn, how do they mutate? So this whole issue of controlling these highly complex systems to make them transpar uh, transparent and to make them controllable, uh, I think that's a key research challenge today in order to ensure that the values according to which we want to live um, are respected by these machines. Thank you very much. So many more questions. So at this point, I just need to do a little bit of a technical check. I'd just like to uh, thank our remote participation uh, moderator, uh, Sebastian Schweder from Amnesty, who's been a member of the Digital Rights Expert Group at Amnesty International, and his, uh, his employer, Shaper and partner law firm in Bonn, have kindly let him come all the way up to Berlin today. So Sebastian, I just want to check, are there people on remote participation ready to ask the questions? Is anybody listed there yet? Um. There, uh, so, um, there's uh, one participant who just logged in. Mm -hmm. um, I am not sure if, uh, he, uh -huh. if she has a question, yeah. but um, I will make sure um, okay. to gather any, uh, to collect any question. So they'll be listening. I have a question now. We'll, go to, we'll do two questions, I think, just so we can get the questions on the table. And I will request the panelists to answer as briefly as is feasible, mainly because Renata has to leave at 5.30, so I want her to have at least a couple of questions under her belt before she goes. <laughs> so uh, we have the first question, and the other thing is, I know there are some remote participants uh, from London who are youth, young students who have sent questions in, so if they have not been, been able to get the bandwidth, um, I'll ask the question that they sent me in on their behalf, if that is acceptable. But um, let's have the first question from Stephen. I believe Stephen is in the room. There are roaming mics, uh, well, there are standing mics, so um, just give us a moment. And, and I'll take that question from Stephen, and then one, if it is a remote participant, or I'll speak for them. So Stephen. Okay, hi, thank you. Um, so my question is, um, should the use of AI for certain purposes be banned or at least limited due to the risk these processes pose for human rights? Okay. And is Chan Yu online, uh, Sebastian? Um, no. Okay. No, well, I have a question from... Uh, I'll open the floor. <laughs> Parminda, you'll get... That's okay. Plenty of time. Uh, I have a question from Chan U, who sent a question in here, and I think it links very nicely. Uh, she wants to know this. Since data is essential to machine learning, how do we measure and mitigate the political, gender, racial bias in the data? So, um, the panelists, who wants to go first to answer both of them, neither of them, or one of them? I wonder, Paul? Yeah, Just I briefly, can, uh, please. So Thank you. So on uh, bans, we have a long history of uh, banning this or that technology. We have, you know, chemicals which have very great uh, impact against certain insects, but have been banned because of their side effects. Uh, you, you know, we ban cars without seat belts and so on and so on. So I think uh, certainly there will be a technology uh, which also in the future will be banned. Atomic power is uh, one example here in Germany, which is being in the course of being banned. And I think for AI, one cannot exclude this uh, at all. The question is also, uh, this was discussed in the AI high level group, should it be actually allowed to research in order to give AI a soul, to develop programs which have human emotions, human feelings, um, and there were some uh, in the group who said, no, this should be actually a red line. We should not develop machines which uh, have uh, human emotions, which feel pain, for example, because, uh, you know, interesting reasoning, because this would be an innovation obstacle for technology, because in the moment, a technology feels like a human feels, you cannot actually treat it as an object anymore. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I think, Renata, you have a, a response. Yeah, 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 I agree. I agree that we need to regulate and we need also to... It, I think that the global trade system and the global rules on commerce are not prepared to deal with this regulation and it will be like a big battle. And I'm very afraid of that battle because I, I feel that uh, our field of uh, privacy and human rights uh, experts and activists and campaigners is completely disconnected uh, from the global trade arena. And there's an upcoming ministerial in Nur Sultan uh, next year in June. And all these issues will be touched. And we need to, uh, this is the moment of th that preemptive fight because if, uh, if uh, the global rules on commerce are are uh, crystallized in a global agreement on these topics, we will not, it, it's really hard to undo. And okay. then it will be really hard to regulate. In, in that line, it is not only ban, banning, but it, it is uh, like with uh, some dangerous, uh, when handling some dangerous materials or when doing some risky activities, we have increased scrutiny to protect uh, human, uh, humanity, basically. And, and uh, also key word in here is transparency. And the, uh, we cannot accept, like we cannot, uh, we have to reject uh, the terms of closed, uh, uh, like black boxes, but also closed rooms. We need to see the effects and we need to evaluate. Is it, it's, it's changing the culture because it, you, usually when you have something in the market, it goes kind of, kind of by itself. With this kind of technology, we need to supervise at different stages and measure different effects. So it, it will be like very, and, and I shared the concern on where the Global South is there, because will, be, will we be able to deploy those systems of evaluation and measurement? Okay, so of course it isn't just about banning, but who gets to ban what as well. Marcus and Shai, do you have any comments to this, this particular, we'll move to the second one in a minute. Uh, yeah, um, uh, the question on data is the one I would like to answer. Oh, okay, before yeah. you do, just checking, Marcus, did you want to respond to the ban, or do you want to respond to the data? A bias. Uh, quickly to the ban, I, as I said before, uh, I, we, we, we believe that it needs a legally binding prohi prohibition, for instance, on the development, production, and use of lethal autonomous weapon systems. Um, but as Paul mentioned, I, I think one thing is to, to look at those areas which, which clearly infringe fundamental rights or like the right to, li to live and, and, and uh, the lack of accountability and remedy in, in these cases. But as we, as we are moving forward at a high pace, I think um, one thing is to have the built-in default, which Paul mentioned, uh, to make sure that we develop ways of, of having a, a human rights respecting development. But I think the other one is to make sure that, that companies developing also uh, are part of a human, they have all their production and development processes as part of a binding um, human rights due diligence, due diligence process. So that okay. not only the built-in process is there, but also there is a constant assessment while research and development are happening. Thank you, that's very clear. So let's move to the second question, which I will repeat. Since data is essential to machine learning, how do, we measure, how do we mitigate the political, gender, racial, and other sorts of biases in the data? So, Jay, you wanted to uh, speak to that. Yeah. Um, we can look uh, for this at uh, the fintech sector, and then there, there are, in the fintech sector, pre-AI laws uh, that prevent discrimination in terms of who you give loans to, for example. Uh, the regulatory challenge now is to translate those laws to the use of machine learning and the use of big data sets. It's not always possible to regulate the inputs that go into an algorithm or the way an algorithm is written, for example, uh, because it's not always possible to prove the correlations that were used. But uh, it is possible to regulate the outputs. It is possible to set standards for outputs and for which we are agreeing a lot, but I would like to agree with Renata again, uh, where it's crucial to preserve policy space for states to be able to do this, uh, for people to be able to democratically engage with their state and ask for certain standards for issues that matter to them, and for which it is again crucial that uh, e-commerce agreements at the international level are not at this moment signed. All right, any other comments to the issue around data as, data as biased, racially biased, uh, gender biased? No? Uh, maybe, maybe yes, um, sure. I mean, I, you know, 
if you develop AI for the purpose of optimizing torture or for the purpose of mass surveillance. You know, there are companies which do this already and, you know, they have great customers among dictatorships in the world. We have the problem, for example, that our data protection law in Europe, it doesn't cover technology. So you can actually produce legally technology for an illegal purpose, which is to grab data, to scrap it, to do mass surveillance. And I think this question of um, having a limit on purposes for development, like, you know, is it actually allowed to develop AI for torture or AI for mass surveillance, which will be illegal in most cases? Uh, I think with the increasing power and ubiquity of this technology, these will become very serious and important questions. So the question of ban is a question which is important, and I agree also on uh, autonomous lethal weapons. We already see uh, the, the, the discussion starting and uh, at least some uh, thinking going in the right direction. On the data, I would say, um, if we just unchecked take data as it exists today, the empirics of today, we live in a society where there's a lot of discrimination, then we just perfect the discrimination of tomorrow because AI will in an automatic way perfectly apply the discrimination which exists in society today. Um, so, and, to, and by the way, we will also have no impetus in these machines. These machines don't have the human impetus which you may find in a judge who says, you know, the practice which we had until now, it's actually not okay. We have to change jurisprudence. This impetus of wanting to do the better, to ask how should the world be rather than how is it, is not present in these machines. So I think we need a, a very important uh, thinking about how actually societal innovation, technical innovation also, and how the quest of the human being, which grows out of discontent with what is, is actually finding its way in this future where the machines take decisions on the basis of past empirics. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Liz. Uh, we're not, before we even ban, we just don't start kind of idea. So it's a very important point. Thank you so much, bringing in, about, bringing in weapons. Renata, you had a comment about yeah, yeah, biased because, data. Uh, because, uh, yeah. well, um, you know, the, one of the uh, areas where this is more, um, there's more enthusiasm to implement AI is in uh, social protection and in large interventions to the poorest and more vulnerable. And usually that's the case, you know, usually the experimentation, the level of experimentation and the decisions go uh, to places where they can, uh, where the harm can be like really, really uh, something lethal and leave uh, people out of uh, social protection systems and so on. And especially women, women and certain type of women. So we need to also look at the role of states and, and, and local governments on this and the responsibility the states and local governments have to play in, uh, not only respecting but enforcing human rights, and I th uh, what we are like uh, we just launched recently a plus alliance, and it's an initiative that is precisely looking in how to reverse uh, in advance in the design how to reverse and prevent that that uh, at least in the social protection area, at least for women, this this bias is corrected in time because it's. Um, is one of the, like, women will be affected, are already being affected by the systems, and it is an obstacle for gender yeah. equality. Thank you so much. So, moving on to the third question, I just want to note we have two people waiting on remote. One is Elizabeth, just to let her know that her turn will come, she's already queued, and we have one also, also on remote who will get a chance towards the end. So, just not right now, just so that we know no. they're there. Um, oh, there's no question yet. Um, no, 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 uh, but just so they know. They're, that they're just that online. We haven't forgotten them. <laughs> okay, so we have a third question from Claudia, and also could I ask Rainer if um, he is in the room to get ready for the fourth question. So first of all, Claudia, would you like to pose your question uh, to our panel? Yes, hello. Um, so as we know, AI needs data, and without data there is no AI, so I see a big field of tension between data protection and AI. So my question is, is there any way to make AI-based data collection and analysis less intrusive? Thank you, that was short and sweet, thank you. Any way we could make AI-based or AI-biased data collection uh, database, uh, actually less intrusive? So response, equally quick and short responses perhaps to that question, maybe it's just a yes or no. Paul, can you do it in a yes or no? 
uh, maybe? Right. No, I mean, if, uh, <laughs> if things get interesting, it's, it's always a little bit boring to say, and please answer in one sentence. Um, so first of all, AI is something which with great benefit can apply to non-personal data. You know, take the weather forecast, you know, will become much better with AI. Let's not get so much hung up on that AI has to be used for personal data because the, the biggest interest there is public relations and advertising. And really this technology, if we want to use it for the good of humanity, the first concern is not to make it possible for advertisement to use AI. So I would say, let's be creative and invest in searching for opportunities for AI in research, in physics, in chemistry, in science, which have nothing to do with personal data. And there, there's no problem, and let's go for it. And you know, there's a lot of opportunity there. If you think of AI to model the world climate change developments, you know, it would be nice to have. OK, that's a very important point doesn't always have to be about personal data, therefore the question of intrusiveness may not arise. Renata? And in the case that they are doing it, I think that pilots, having bi uh, small pilots before doing like the big deployments is necessary, and having those pilots, pilots open to different groups, to academia, to uh, human rights groups, and so on, so uh, it is like a process of validation somehow and incentivating that, but that needs resources, and, and there's not so many uh, actors willing to uh, invest in pilots to evaluate whether it's feasible. All the innovation happens in locked rooms again. Okay, thank you. Consultation in, at, by design. <laughs> um, Marcus Orche. Yeah, just just uh, very briefly, I think one thing is what we said, non-personal data. I think the other one is uh, the pattern we look for. And I think in general, my feeling is that there is a debate. We still have to go much more into around the data and uh, probabilities. And, um, and the way that uh, probabilities and the aim uh, to determine uh, future behaviors have become a part of the IA. A paradigm, and I think that's that's the thing around personal data, which which is the most relevant to look at in the, and and find a new paradigm um, to secure self determination and autonomy of the individual. Okay, thank you, and uh, Shai. Just very briefly, I think we should enforce the principle that just because you can collect a lot of data doesn't mean you should. Thank you, Raina. I think you're waiting at a mic. Thank you very much. Hello. Okay. Thanks a lot for giving the the opportunity. Um, I have a question regarding um, decisions from AI systems. Um, who should be held accountable for this? Uh, may it be um, may it be maybe the recognition of recognition of uh, traffic. A traffic signal somehow from a from a automated driving car. May it be image recognition from a drone for like some drone strikes or something like this. So I'm my impression is that maybe the individual using it can't really be held accountable because they don't understand how it works. But the the machine itself also not because it's a tool. It's 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 a tool somehow. But who is it? Is it the programmers or is it the is it the organization buying it or the person deploying the algorithms or who should or and is maybe some is there already something in the data protection law that could already be applied for this? Thanks Thank a lot. You. So who rather than what should be held accountable and does existing a law uh, is that adequate for holding who accountable, whoever that might be? Thank you. So let's have some responses from our panelists. Accountability, this is a very important uh, part of the work and the thinking, because this is the operationalization of all our <laughs> dreams and desires. <laughs> Accountability, who takes the rap, as they say, and who should take the rap? Or should we outsource it to a robot, <laughs> who after all has no feelings, so they don't care? I mean, this isn't just science fiction, this stuff is actually happening. Uh, in many ways, so I'm not being facetious. I think 
let's try and address the accountability question at this point in the proceedings. There are other questions to come, so I'm just going to cue Lena um, for when Lena's ready eventually. So, uh, Renata, accountability, please. Yes, in case of doubt, everyone, like everyone involved in the process. I think that is a, is a nice incentive for everyone to be responsible in the process, the company developing the technology, the authority deploying it, or the person deploying it. And I think that, that, that we need to take this very aggressive approach. If I was a judge, and a case of this, uh, of this kind will arrive to my table, I will adopt that like, really broad approach on this, because it's so, if, if we go, if we repeat the mistakes of not holding anyone accountable, as we did with the oil companies or other um, big, powerful industries, I think that we risk a lot. So full responsibility to broad extent and up to the, up to the up to president of the company, you know? In so charge. you're saying yeah. it should be the Aggressive. designers, the owners, and the organization, and that would imply the governments yeah. uh, as well. And the so investors even. Point and taken. Everyone. So if I could just press a little bit, I'm getting into Fiona Bruce's role here. If I could just press our panel to ask, we can't be all accountable all the time to everything. So perhaps, uh, Paul, do you have a comment to maybe governments or to address specifically the question as to who should be accountable at which point? Well, yeah, so your question was, is there already something in law on this? And yes, there is actually, because Google, in the right to be forgotten case with a Spanish citizen who wanted to not be listed anymore by Google, um, uh, rehearsed the argument in that case that Google is not responsible for the search results which come up because it's the algorithm who does it in an automated way. And uh, seriously, they wanted to shield the company from this uh, uh, algorithm, and the judges said, no way. So that is the leading case, actually, on responsibility. The fact that there is an automated system, AI system, algorithm, doesn't shield the natural or legal person which puts this in business and makes money with it from responsibility. And I think this is something we have to maintain. I think there can be no question of, of giving responsibility just to a machine or just to robots. This really only serves to de-responsibilize the people behind it which, which make money with this and, and put it into the world. Thank you so much, Paul. That's a very important point. Outsourcing to machines, not a good idea. Chai? Um, I think there's a moral hazard on one side and a moral crumple zone on the other. The moral hazard being that if you don't hold the people responsible, uh, there's an incentive to be reckless. And the moral crumple zone is that uh, innocent people get punished for something they, don't, they did not actually do. So I think there ought to be different levels of responsibility for different types of users of AI and the kind of impact that uh, the, the kind of adverse impact it has had. And also importantly, as Marcus said, uh, due diligence requirements initially in terms of how the code is developed and um, implemented. So a proper chain of command with someone held responsible. There are uh, existing regulations in certain sectors, specifically in finance, that already do this for AI in the US. So maybe we can look at that. Thank you, Marcus. Do you have anything to add at this point? I, I, I think it just em emphasizes how important it is to look at decisions which are solely algorithm determined um, and, uh, and to trigger consequence automatically that here, number one, the, con the, the responsibility, of course, is totally clear, but it just shows that, that this can only be, uh, be, be applicable for, for a very, very narrow um, area of, of, of application. But in general, we need, we need that, that, uh, that we have people still in the loop um, who, who also then share the responsibility with those who put systems in place. And therefore, as, as you just met, uh, reminded, it is in the interest of companies to have a clear binding national and international regulation which, which regulates due diligence within the process because it not only builds trust and um, takes care of responsibility, but it also makes sure that there is risk management on the company side, okay. uh, which is, of course, is important. Thank you. Now, I have a, an eye on the time. We have, one, we have a question from uh, Lena here. Could I just note the empty chair, um, whether by, uh, we did invite the tech sector to uh, participate, and they do have the right to respond. Uh, so just in case anybody's wondering, they were invited. 
because sometimes we are challenged okay. about our which, multi-stakeholderism. Which, which company was invited? Uh, Google was ah, invited. Ah, Google was invited. Okay. okay. Mm. So anyway, just 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 to clarify in case there any just in ca clarify in case anybody's wondering, no more to be said. We need to move now to the next question so that Renata has a chance if she wishes to respond to it before she needs to leave. So Lena, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So actually, my question was partly for Google, but uh, so it's a good that you reminded us of that. My question is on oversight mechanisms, oversight bodies. What do you think, what role can they play? And what is it, what resources do they need to be able to fulfill that oversight role on this rather new technology? And then with regard to the private sector, do you think that self-regulation is sufficient or does it need greater oversight over the private sector? Thank you. So, Renata, would you like to respond? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not a big friend of self-regulation, and I mean, especially because we are dealing with some something so powerful here. We cannot leave, leave those who cannot do not want to even open their offices. For I mean, when you visit the office for Google, just for the visit, you have to sign an NDA. So that's the level of trust that they have when they communicate with other stakeholders. So I, I don't believe in their self-regulation. I think there is only PR. Exercise. I have been. I have seen many of these of those mechanisms are an insult uh, to the human rights community. I, I will say, but I also worry because on the other side we don't have the resources. We don't have this sophisticated knowledge to uh, to to be a counterpart in these mechanisms. This is a big burden. I think that the state has to re resolve that with. Uh, a series of measures, and in that, I'm very worried about the capture of universities because many universities dealing with the AI are like floated with money either either from these big companies or uh, from uh, projects uh, dedicated to the military. So we we are very in a very bad position uh, when uh, we we talk about oversight because on the one hand we cannot trust them the potential per per perpetrators, we cannot trust them. And on the other hand, uh, we are not equipped as uh, a citizen space uh, with the uh, right tools to hold them accountable. Thank you very so, much, Renata. Yeah. I think it's a good segue now to Paul. I think you have some responses to this, particularly from the Data Ethics Commission's work. So please go ahead. And Renata will just quietly. Uh, just before, Paul, uh, thank you so much, Renata, for making it. And uh, all the best. And uh, gracias. And we'll see you. Thank you. Yes, so um, as I said initially, um, it's not only the view of the Ethics Commission in Germany, but also the President of the European Commission in her policy guidelines has very clearly said that we need a law uh, to ensure that our values are respected by this technology. And I think this um, statement is based first of all on a recognition that we can have a level playing field in the internal market, but also globally, only if we have a law which obliges everyone and not uh, leave it to you know people joining or not joining some self-regulatory code. I would also say there is some learning in Silicon Valley if you read uh, you know the article of Mark Zuckerberg in the Washington Post of 30th of March, the new book of uh, Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft, or the statement of Kent Walker, the chief lawyer of Google. They all now say we actually need laws. Um, and we are ready to submit to democracy. That's very new music. Uh, that's not John Perry Barlow anymore, you know, the independence of cyberspace. Um, so I think those who say we don't need law are increasingly lonely. Uh, even the president of Google said we need sector-specific law. So he doesn't want a general law on AI, but only sector-specific law. So I think we are now actually at the point after years of ethics committees and ethics debate to answer the question, what has to be in the law? I think the question of whether to have a law or not is already in Europe is finished. The question is, what has to be in there? Now, as to bodies of oversight, that's of course going to be a classic debate. You know, in Europe there is a classic reaction, oh, please, no new institutions, no new bodies. But then again, this is called the light touch policy. You know, let's not create new institutions. But on the other hand, uh, politics and governments in Europe recognize that, and companies are claiming that this technology will be the big thing. It will be ubiquitous, it will solve all great problems, it will be powerful, and we are starting to throw a lot of money at this technology as a basis for technological and economic future. 
-hmm. And then to say that this huge thing, which will be present everywhere, it doesn't need an institutional structure of oversight, is a little bit, I would say, risky, to say the least. So I think the discussion will rather focus, like you can see it in the German data ethics um, and, um, and, and also on the European level, the debates, on how to build the oversight. For example, on the question, are the existing institutions, the powers of which and the competence of which in terms of technology abilities can be enlarged to exercise this oversight or what type of new institutions one needs. The European Parliament in the last mandate already put a report on the table and said uh, very clearly we need a European certification body uh, for this. So I think um, it's now important to focus on how to do it rather than on the weather. Okay, thank you very much. We've moved, we need to think about uh, appropriate, focused, and human rights-based law. So it, we are talking here about human rights law already exists, the national level and the international level. So Marcus, did you have any comments here about oversight? Um, are there current human rights institutions sufficient oversight to address the issues that Paul has just rightly raised? Or do we need something else? I mean, I mean Paul, 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 I think, very rightly pointed out that it, it will need a combination of uh, the empowerment and capacity building of existing institutions and oversight bodies, and at the same time also the development of, of new ones. I, I mean, what I see is that we are seeing that governments and international bodies are reacting, they are moving, perhaps not as fast as technology and the tech sector has been moving, but, but they are stepping up. And so, so I would think that, uh, yes, it's possible. I think it's going to be a challenge and there might be some need also to look at certain areas where we pause and halt uh, to make sure that institutions and oversight mechanisms can be installed. So for instance, uh, where we see that the public sector and governments bring in private companies to take over public services and um, also deliver uh, public goods um, with the application of artificial intelligence, I think this shouldn't happen before we don't have um, the right institutions and, and, and oversight okay. uh, bodies in place. Just on self-regulation, as we this year have the 70th anniversary of um, the signing of the Declaration of Human Rights, and we've since then seen the establishment of uh, international human rights legal framework, we've seen UN core conventions and many constitutional guarantees around human rights. I mean, I think history shows us that there wouldn't be human rights if they were based on self-regulation. Um, so uh, I think that's the I think I, I think that's the lesson we learned from much. history. I think Paul, um, I think you both put your finger on it. I think Shai, you've got something you want to say, but I want to give some time to a couple more questions and from the floor. Um, and we also have the party has already decided to start. So uh, thanks, um, they're practicing. It's called a sound check. Sounds to me like they're rehearsing the whole the whole um, playlist. But anyway, I'm um, Shai for you. Yeah. Um, very quickly, I think there absolutely needs to be oversight and that it has to be public, uh, so it cannot be like Facebook's recent efforts to have an oversight board, which is entirely handpicked by Facebook, essentially. Uh, because if you want to function as a company, as a public utility, you have to have public oversight. If you don't like that, you should consent to your monopoly being broken up. Okay, so I, um, I have a remote participant, Elizabeth Nerfer, who's um, been waiting patiently. Elizabeth has a question. Is she on audio? Or do we, how does that work? Yeah. Is she ready? I think she should be. She might, might have gone off and made a cup of tea. Gin and tonic. Hot chocolate. Uh, maybe just cue her, let her know that we'd like her to ask a question, because we have another question she's, that we can ask. She, she's online now. She's online. Hi, um, hi, Elizabeth. Great, you could make it. It's brilliant. First time at the IGF through remote participation. I'm a full supporter of these wonderful uses of technology to in, um, increase participation. Elizabeth, we're all listening to you. Your question, please. Well, you know, technology yeah, is a problem of participation. Here she is. 
Um, so I was asking, there is a tension between the business side of things and the way of putting ethics first. And I don't know if we can um, make an international agreement if some countries really play out um, artificial intelligence to be the future tool of sovereignty. So I ask myself, is it feasible that um, all powers who develop AI at the, at the moment uh, agree on one international ethic agreement? Do you think that's reasonable? Is that reasonable or feasible? feasible. Okay, I think it's a good question. Uh, I do need to ask our panelists to be brief in the answers, if you can. Uh, it's a big question. I know it requires a big answer, but let's just see. Shay, do you have an answer to this question? No. She's thinking about it. Fair enough. Uh, Marcus. Reasonable, of course. Feasible. I, I, think, I think someone has to start. I think we move ahead. Whether China is prepared to join will, will, or, or others, uh, even the US, uh, will depend on, on, on many things, but it's worth trying. And what it, I think, for all needs is that we all start to get this discussion not only out of, of this room, but out of all these spaces, because if it's about the future of our societies and economies, uh, and we really believe that we live in democratic countries, we haven't even started in, in, in opening a space for people to participate, or to even understand, despite then uh, participate. So while I think, yes, we need this international space, we also have to bring this to the, to the local, very practical day-to-day -day level of at least some basic understanding and participatory discussions. Thank you. Um, Paul, feasible, yeah. reasonable? Yeah, I think it's uh, always good to work on uh, global coherence and, in fact, on AI. There is already an OECD uh, text, which is not binding, but agreed with the US. Uh, amazing turnaround of the US and the OECD on this. Uh, endorsed also by G20, which contains some of the buzzwords which we were also here discussing. Um, to get to something more binding, of course, you know, that's a long way and there's a good rule when it comes to protection of fundamental rights that you don't wait until you have a global agreement before you start doing it. We in Europe, we deliver the rights from our Charter of Fundamental Rights to people. So we do GDPR and then we see how, who else is following. But in the Council of Europe, which is the bigger, um, more members holding international organization in Europe, which has Turkey in it, Russia and so on, there's now a working group which starts on a feasibility study on an agreement, international multilateral agreement on rules for AI. And you know, this is how Convention 108 started on data protection. So I wouldn't discard it. I would say it's worth working on it. We certainly support this work. Um, but at the same time, to say, oh, let's wait until there's a global agreement before we re regulate domestically, that would be a huge mistake, and I don't think that's what we're going to do. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Now, we have another remote participant who's been waiting. Oh, sorry, Shai. Sorry, yes. Um, the, the reason I hesitated is because there's a geopolitics to ethics as well, and uh, that should not be obscured. With that caveat, sure, it's reasonable to have an international agreement on ethics. Again, given, like he said, that there is nothing that prevents nation states from doing what an international agreement would do, I think. Okay, so we do have, uh, I think it's Shaklo. Is Shaklo able to speak their question, ask their question for it by remote? Just checking. She She's not online. Is she? She's not okay. online anymore. Okay, she's not online anymore. Um, I'm just going to put a question. I'm not going to ask us to answer it because I want to move to the audience. I've got a couple of other questions. There was a question sent in from Chan U who asked an earlier question. I think it's appropriate just to have it in the text for us to consider. She is asking the human rights implications of artificial intelligence have been heavily discussed. Presuming that artificial intelligence could become conscious actors in the near future. What about the artificial intelligent rights of machines? So this is really pushing the envelope. I just want it out there, uh, because at the moment we've been making distinction that at the moment our artificial intelligences are only machines and could never have feelings. Uh, and so I think um, just consider that, leave that hanging. I, I would like to uh, turn to the floor. I have Annette Mulberg here, who was here, where's she gone? I think There's you are the already at the mic, yeah, and it always good on cue. I have Guru, I have Parminda, 
I have, don't know your name, but you're after Parminder, so who, number, that's enough, number three. Three, brief questions, but Aneta, your question, because I know you sent it in, so please ask your question. All right, thank you. I have a question on the dignity and rights of workers who are in a special situation of dependency. So my question is, how are the rights of workers safeguarded in the development and implementation of AI processes in respect to co-decision making, informational self-determination, data protection of employees, for example, AI analyzing behavioral data of employees, the question of autonomy of decision making at work and liability in case something goes wrong. And how can companies and governments in their role as employers be prevented from evading responsibility by simply transferring critical AI processing to unaccountable third parties like LinkedIn, Xing and others? Thank you very much, Annette. I'm just going to take two more questions because it's important we get the questions out there. Um, the rights of workers and whether uh, their employers should wriggle out of those rights by um, outsourcing to third party artificial intelligences or digital intelligences. Um, but Guru, you had a question. You need to get to a mic though to be able to ask it. There's a mic back there. Parminder, can you get yourself to a mic? Uh, but I'll just hold you. Just need to get those questions on the floor. So, yeah, just, yeah, you can. Yeah, uh, Alex mentioned that uh, surveillance is a very bad use of AI and he said dictators are going to be using it. Uh, the only proof we've had so far of use is not by dictatorship, by the most powerful democracy in the world, the US and the big five, uh, the five eyes who have, who have been and who are surveilling the entire world. So the question that I have is, uh, uh, these companies are American, most of them, and some of them are, of course, Chinese. And we are talking about the OECD and EU laying down processes and rules which are applicable within those regions. But I come from India. And I think there are many countries in the developing world, in Asia, in Africa, in South America. Uh, I don't know whether we can count on America or Europe to ensure that the human rights in these regions are protected as well. So the question to the panelists is, what, what do you think are frameworks or methods by which we can make sure that human rights is not a privilege of the well-to-do? Thank you. A very important question. Um, so the third and last question for this last bunch is Parminder, please. Uh, hello, uh, Parminder from IT for Change. And actually, I carry on from what Guru said. Uh, uh, our friend Paul from uh, the European Commission was rightly talking about uh, making international agreements. And Marcus rightly said uh, that there would have been no human rights if we were just following self-regulation, but there would have also been no human rights if we did not go the multilateral way. They are multilateral treaties. And for a long time, there has been effort by developing countries to develop a digital governance mechanism in the UN, a, at least a place where policy discussions could take place. And for long developing countries, Europe, US have not allowed any such development to take place, while saying that digital is distributed in different sectors, but while OECD, you rightly mentioned, has a digital economy policy committee, which develops AI policies and develops public policies on the internet, but they do not allow UN-based similar committee to get developed, which is a big problem because AI concentrates power, and AI concentrates power globally, and unless there's a democratization over the governance of AI, developing countries cannot expect just technical protocols from US, EU, or even China uh, to be shared as global governance mechanisms. So the question is, would that situation has now been thought to have come where we need a global policy or norms making mechanism which is tied to the UN? Thank you. Okay, so the role of the UN and our global norms policy making mechanism based in the UN where all me member states have a vote and can be involved. So we have a question about the rights of workers, and we have two questions about calling the rich, privileged, agenda-setting uh, players to account from the Global South, if I could sum it up like that way. So uh, first of all, a response about the rights to workers, for workers might be difficult because we haven't got uh, necessarily employers. But does the panel have any comments on that first important question from Annette? Uh, Jay, you go for it. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a very important question, and uh, we at IT for Change do think that uh, 
workers who create data should have a say in how that data is used and for what purpose. And uh, this does not apply only to gig workers, but also to uh, traditional factory workers who are increasingly now creating data at the workplace. I know that consciousness on this is rising among workers and their unions. I think it's important that keeps happening. Paul, do you want anything specific about the rights of workers and problems with employers shifting the blame or shifting the accountability if things go wrong? Well, I would say in Europe, in many countries, um, of course, there are uh, existing rules, and it's, I think it's very important not to give the impression that these rules don't apply to AI because the AI, word AI doesn't come up in the in the law, or even the word data doesn't come up in the law. I mean, there are rules on, you know, having to uh, consult or even agree with the shop stewards on, you know, the observation of workers and you know their performance assessment and so on. So I think the first step here has to be. Let's apply those rules directly also to new technologies and identify precisely where there are gaps. And if necessary, if uh, the technology really changes the balance, uh, then um, uh, to to amend the laws because you know it's, it, I think it's very I think there's a rather broad consensus that in the balance uh, between social partners, uh, technology should not uh, change the balance between workers and employees. And so. Mm, you know, let's work with the laws and let's not create the impression that workers have no rights when AI is introduced, for example, to analyze their behavior and uh, because they do have these rights and, uh, and I think rather we should tell the people to exercise their rights and, uh, and then if we find there are no rights, well, you know, let's, let's put them into law. Thank you So very this much. is a problem of labor law. In other countries, I can imagine those rights don't exist and, you know, that is a fight to be fought. Thank you very much. Now we have the, uh, we're moving up a level, the issue about the ongoing role of the UN and why the UN cannot be a suitable space to start crunching out these problems between the powerful nations and the uh, least well, less well resourced nations. So we have Guru and Parminder's question I think are linked. So does the panel want to respond to that challenge about the double, uh, possibly if I understand it correctly, a bit of a double standard. Um, human rights and the AI for you, but maybe we, We'll figure it out when it suits us. Um, this is not a new question, but it's an important one that requires repeated asking. So, Marcus. Yeah, I, I, I think Paul already referred to that. We've seen quite, quite a number of international multilateral um, convention and regulations which have their starting points from, uh, from regional. Um, from regional conventions and re regional in initiatives. So I, I do believe that um, we, al we, al we also see uh, the, the effect GP, um, uh, GDPR has, has had uh, uh, not only in Europe but across. So I, 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 I do believe that, um, that the initiatives we've seen in Europe but also by the UN High Commissioner for, for Human Rights in these areas and also lo looking at some of the the initiatives we've seen on other areas of uh, digitalization, like for instance, the initiative from Germany and Brazil on uh, the strengthening of uh, privacy and others. So I do believe that it's, it's, I do believe that we will get um, to um, UN level um, conventions in these areas and that there will be a dynamic um, and I think the challenge is that uh, while this might lag on, there might be a, 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 a control lag and there might be a power play in certain parts of the globe where we don't have safeguards at this point to, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, guarantee rights holders' rights. Um, but I think we just have to uh, we just have to then go back and and push back even if developments have taken place um, which are not human rights respecting. I mean we already see this the the UN special rapporteur on uh, extreme poverty uh, just a few weeks ago um, presented a report on artificial intelligence in uh, welfare systems across the globe, and we already see developments which are highly problematic and but I think it, it it shouldn't discourage us that we can push back and we can also roll back some of these systems and developments which which have happened so far 
Thank you. Now, uh, Paul, you have a comment, you have a response? And yes. I know Shai has here, so please. Yeah. So, um, the, U the EU is unfortunately, we are not member of, we are not full member of the, of the UN, but the conventions which are made in the Council of Europe are open for anybody's signature. So, for example, the... Um, 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 so, uh, for example, the U.S. has signed up to an agreement which is rather helping a little bit, uh, let's say, uh, uh, repressive purposes, which is the Budapest Convention on Cybersecurity, but we have invited the U.S. a number of times to sign up to Convention 108 on data protection. There's a big debate now in Washington going on on data protection, and maybe that debate would be facilitated by just signing up uh, to this convention, and many other countries, can, uh, Canada uh, is also, uh, and we have some South American company, uh, countries who have signed up, so that's absolutely possible. So there is a way to do um, international conventions, and I would say many countries, in uh, many developing countries, you know, they are invited to sign up, and it's a, it's a domestic discussion whether, uh, you know, the governments are willing to go this way or not. Uh, nobody is against the UN doing this or that, but the UN, of course, is extremely, extremely slow. And I think these um, technology issues in particular, you know, they need fast action and fast moving forward. And um, so, you know, as I said, we in Europe, we have to protect, first of all, our citizens, and that's why we're doing our domestic laws. We work with others to do multilateral agreements which are open to others to sign up and please join the train uh, rather than saying we want a different train. I wish you good luck. Okay, thank you. I'm shy and then Marcus has one point to add because we have another question and I have another one queued here. So I'm keeping an eye on the time. Uh, the beer is getting colder while we wait, so it's okay. We have 20 minutes. Okay, um, shy. I think... Uh, it, the question has never been, should there be international governance of the internet, uh, because the internet is a global thing, but uh, what the appropriate forum for that governance is. And uh, the UN, for example, is a more appropriate forum than a trade body like the World Trade Organization, because I would not think that a trade organization should determine uh, what the levels of security of a transaction should be, or uh, whether source codes should be allowed to be uh, revealed or not. And so I think it is a question of forum and it is a question of how democratic the forum is. Thank you very much. And Marcus, you had a point just to yeah, add just, just on global solutions, I think as there's still the strong narrative that some of these things cannot be done, I think it's so important that we prove everybody wrong who says that in a digital future there can be no safeguarding of human rights and fundamental rights. So I think what, wherever we can, we can prove them wrong and make the point, I think it has a highly important, uh, it's an important signal for others to follow on a very practical level. Thank you. Um, could you state your name for the record? Alberto Diaz. So. so Thank you for taking my question. Um, <clears throat> considering that data is the fuel for AI, whatever information is inside the data will power a machine, and then something will happen, then a certain output comes. So I'll give a simple example of a decision that is very human. For instance, I will drive from one location to another one, and then I can keep in mind that I was I will just get there. I can think I want to get there fast, so I drive fast. I can also think I want to keep in mind um, environmental factors, such as reducing CO2. Then maybe I won't drive this fast. So if we want to input this into a machine, then the machine can optimize the situation and, says, and say, I will bring this car really fast or I can bring this car really environmentally efficient, then my question would be, how can we include not like non-explicit um, parameters into decision-making from AI that also includes the environment, such as the SDGs? But then okay. this is not a, a, a part of the of the function of the AI, but it's apart from the everything that happens because this AI is doing something. Thank you. That's, uh, I'm going to add the last question. I have nobody else from the floor. Okay, forever. Ah, 
Okay. Um, implicit, implicit considerations, how do they get factored into uh, whether IA is up to the job of making inferences about what might be needed? Then we have another question. What measures are in place to deal with, this is from Fiona who sent this in, what measures are in place to deal with international conflict about the governance of AI? So this is a young person looking ahead to conflicts. And if uh, there are measures in place, what principles of international cooperation could there be in this area? So a little bit of brainstorming maybe, issues around making drawing inferences, the implicit assumptions that might be needed. And then a third question from the floor very briefly. Do you want to go to the mic? Yeah, yeah, just keep it brief. I need, it's five to six and we need some time for summing up when, and responding to these questions. Hello, uh, my name is Dawri Kar. I'm here uh, for the Youth IGF. Um, I wanted to know that, well, I think that many internet intermediaries such as social networks or um, also, well, like they are using um, algorithms, uh, decision-making processes or, or IA tools in order to encounter or to overcome hate speech. And I wanted to know, what do you think about it? Um, like if you think, first of all, if an algorithm could um, effectively do it um, to promote uh, free speech and, um, and how do you think it should be? Or also I would like to know like any resources I can like later look for it so to, so because I want to really know about how to um, alternatives uh, against hate speech in these kind of okay. uh, networks or platforms. An important point because under the uh, pressure of recent events, uh, shootings using live streaming recently in Christchurch and elsewhere, um, and the issue of trolling, revenge porn, whether AI can be used to counter hate speech begs the question of a legal definition of hate speech, but it's a very important point. We have three really big questions. I'm just going to ask our panelists to respond to the ones that strike you as the strongest for you, uh, because then we need to go into the summing up. So, um, Paul, would you like to begin? Would yeah, you have a question? Yeah. Well, I mean, in Europe we have a legal definition of hate speech and uh, surely the machines, they cannot uh, do this perfectly, but they can do it at the core, where I would say, you know, evidently, clearly incitement to violence, clearly in the core of um, inciting hate. So if you're looking for resources, look at our code of conduct, EU code of conduct and hate speech and incitement to violence and the implementation reports there. And, um, you know, it's still necessary to have human uh, touch checking after the machine, but uh, the machines can help. They're not perfect. There's no law which is perfectly enforced by humans. There's no law which is perfectly enforced by machines, but they can help to stem the tide. On the clean car, in democracy, of course, a legislator can decide that in the future when we have automatic cars, the automatic car is, has to be programmed sustainable, clean, with minimum exhaust by default. Yeah, you could imagine that you know, any car you buy will have this type of programming in it, and that you have to make conscious choices, and maybe you're limited in it, uh, to go fast instead of going clean. You know, I mean, this is what the discussions are about already today, about speed limits. And uh, in the same way that we have legislators who say, we don't want any speed limit, Germany, we have a lot of legislators in Europe who say we put in speed limits for safety, but also for environmental purposes. So I think we have to uh, you know, think of the law prescribing uh, certain elements of how the technology is implemented. That has always been the case and should also be the case when it comes to making sustainability work. Thank you. Um, Marcus and then Shai. Marcus, did you have a response to any of those questions? Um, I think Paul has outlined to a large degree. I wasn't sure in the question about the implicity and the explicity, as we also discussed transparency and um, accountability, and given the point with the environment, that that also would be a part we would want to make expressive and, and transparent, but I'm not quite sure about that. On, on, on the conflict, I think that in the area of um, lethal autonomous weapons, 
um, we run a good chance over the next years uh, to, to get a binding international ban for those. I think it's harder um, if we're not looking at totally autonomous uh, lethal weapons and also not necessarily lethal, um, lethal weapons. So there is some discussion, but I think at least in this area, we, we run good chances to, to, to see a binding convention. Thank you. Shai? Yeah, on hate speech, I think the political economy question is to what level we want uh, private censorship to exist. And actually, at this point, we might want a little bit of it, although with uh, transparency. So you would want to know how the decision was made, and you would want to know what parameters were used, and you would want to have control over those parameters as a society. We also need to ask whether, uh, at this point, it's profitable, actually, uh, to the platform for hate speech to proliferate. That's the important question. All right, thank you. So we're drawing it to a close. Um, I know there are a lot more questions. We have many on the uh, record already. Just before we do draw things to a close, I'm going to say the thank yous now, because if I wait till the end, you're all going to be out of the room. So uh, I'd just like to thank our colleagues um, at Amnesty, Elena Rohrbach and Sebastian Schweder, Minda Moreira at the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition, and to invite you to come and join us at Booth 49, we're down at the cool end, above the water, um, and you can help yourselves to charters for human, of human rights and principles for the internet in any language, and offer to translate some other ones in other languages. Um, and that's been the work today, just to get this on the agenda. So to finalize and to ground ourselves before we head off, I'm just going to ask my panelists the difficult task of coming up with one, what we like to call takeaway, in the form of an action point, because our rapporteur here, Minda, we are required by IGF rules to, to have action points. We don't want to get into actionism. We don't want to be, we don't want to be um, you know, uh, too quick to rush to solutions before we know what the questions are. But I do think we've had a very, very productive discussion. So for our thinking going forward, uh, you may raise another question, of course, that might be an action point. So I'd like to ask Marcus to open with his final thought. Paul, and then I'll give Jay the final word. So, thank you. So, if, if this is about everybody's future, and um, the people in the room here, and many people at the IGF here are those who better understand and at least know the questions, I think one action point should be that we should all look at our possibilities and our remit uh, to take this out of these spaces and help everybody understand. And at least you should think about your very personal aim. You, you, you precisely might want to look at how, the, how you take this discussion forward with others into the public debate um, and, and make this one where human beings together shape the way we take this forward. Thank you very much, Marcus. And Paul? Yes, I, I think we cannot deplore uh, the crisis of democracy and the rising populism and at the same time say, oh, let's maintain a light touch and you know, let's have self-regulations and codes of conduct. I think we need to show that democracy really can make a difference by having democratically legitimized rules which are binding and which can be enforced. And I think it's very important that those people who are interested in these issues which we have discussed today and also those who have the technical know-how re-engage with democracy, re-engage with those instances which work for binding rules, which work for lawmaking in democracy. So we have to go beyond debate. We have to go beyond programming and beyond being cool on this or that Congress. But we need sustained engagement in the rulemaking process, in political parties, in big organizations which stick with parliament until the rule is through. And uh, so that's my action point for everybody. Thank you so much, much appreciated. Shai. Okay. The action point I think would be a legal declaration that uh, data and digital intelligence are people's resources because uh, we know now that democratic control over AI is possible and democratic control has consistently been the only way to ensure the existence and enforcement of human rights. So with that, I think I'd like to thank you all for being such a brilliant and very attentive audience and for the great questions. And to thank my panel, Paul Nemitz, 
Jai Vipra and Marcus Baker for their time, their energy, and their commitment, because we know they're going to move forward and make some of this stuff happen. And they're inviting us all to take part, I understand. So the invitation is open. Thank you very much.